Have you ever experienced the process of rebuilding a space? I know Rob in our church, that's his new job. And I know some of you have definitely had to do that when you move. Like Savannah this past year. She is now a Cincinnatian, guys. It's so great. But she sent some photos that we're going to put up on the screen right now. As you can see, the long process of refinishing floors. That's one of the projects that Savannah and her family helped her fix up this house before she could move in. But look how beautiful it turned out in the end. A lot of things are a lot of work. But as you know, if you've ever had to renovate before you move in, or maybe your house went through some damage and you had to be out for a while as things were fixed up, as I know some of us at Echo have experienced, in either scenario, there's this period where you want to live somewhere, but you can't for some reason. And it takes a lot of work to fix it up before you move back in. And then once you're there, there's still more to do, right? And it always takes longer than you anticipate. Just a rule. There's a lot of mixed emotions as you balance anticipation with frustration. You know, similar feelings are going on right now because we are anticipating, wishing we could be back in our building again. And as a church, we've been out for way longer than we imagined. And so close. We're so close. We're getting ready. We're really trying to start that process of moving back in again. A few of us went into the building the other day just to look at where things are, reevaluate the space. There's lesson posters on the wall. There's still clean coffee cups sitting in the lobby waiting for people to drink from. It was like everything was put on pause in the middle of a conversation. It's kind of eerie to feel like, was that really a year ago? We're hopeful that we will be able to return to our building. And we know it's going to be a slow process because we're going to try to do everything so safely to be in proximity with one another again. Today's scripture from the book of Ezra is about an experience of God's people as they make a slow return from exile into their homeland. And it went with this anticipation, but of course there's always frustration along the way. We're in the now, but not yet series as we're finally at the moment when exile is ending and there's a process of renewal and return for God's people. We're in the book of Ezra, chapter one, let's read together. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. So here's another king of Persia. We've talked about some Persian kings before. This is 539 BC. And the point of verse 1 is to let everyone know that everything that's getting ready to happen through this king, no matter how you know big his ego sounds, we're seeing that it is God is the one who moved in this king's heart so that God fulfills his own promise to the Jewish people through himself. He's moving here. And I love the phrase, God stirred Cyrus's heart. I think that would so interesting and it also kind of implies that Cyrus is willing to be stirred. Because if you noticed in all of the study, this whole series, we've seen that not everyone God wanted to use was willing. If you can recall back in the book of Daniel, the last Babylonian king, Belshazzar, God tried to stir his heart, but apparently it was hardened. He was that writing on the wall guy. And when there was that visual of a disembodied hand, and when Daniel spoke to Belshazzar, still it didn't change. Belshazzar's heart did not move. And so he ended up dying and the kingdom was split apart. God stirred the heart though of the Persian king Darius when Daniel was alive, and through the Daniel and the lion's den experience, his heart was changed for the good and for the good of God's people. God stirred the heart of King Xerxes, as we've talked for the past few weeks, through Queen Esther, for the good of God's people. I love that God is willing to use anyone and everyone to accomplish his purpose, and that gives me encouragement. Here, we see that Cyrus... We don't see that he has a dream. We don't see that a specific person talked to him. All we know is God stirred his heart and Cyrus reacted positively. Let's see what he says, verse two. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms on the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem. And may your God be with you. Then God stirred the hearts of the priests 
and Levites and leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And all their neighbors assisted by giving them articles of silver, gold, supplies for the journey, and livestock. They gave them many valuable gifts in addition to all the voluntary offerings. This is it, guys. We have been waiting along with God's people. Well, they were waiting a lot longer than we have. But we finally get to see them begin to go home. Now, from the way this is worded, God is stirring hearts again. If you saw that phrase, again, he's stirring the hearts of his people. And this kind of indicates that not everyone seems to be going back at once. There are some people in Babylon who remain there while this one group decides they will be the first ones, the first wave of people to go back to Jerusalem at this time. But those who still remain there, it says that they sent resources to support those who went on the journey. When I read this, I immediately think of missionaries. Missionaries, people whose hearts God have stirred in order to go to certain places and minister. Not everyone goes, but everyone needs resources. And I hope you know by now that Echo Church very actively supports missionaries, both locally in Cincinnati and around the world. Go to our website, see our online service page. You'll see links to read about all of our missionaries. And just like those neighbors here in Ezra who sent the resources, our missionaries go out, our friends, and we support them. We offer encouragement and time and finances in order to be a part of their journey from right where we are. And every donation you give to Echo Church supports missionaries like these. Moving on, King Cyrus, along the way, as these exiles were headed back home, he gave them gifts. You know what gifts they were? Gold and silver that had been stolen from them. Not really gifts then, property that belonged to their people in the house of God. When the king Nebuchadnezzar had first ransacked Jerusalem, he stole all of these items out of the temple and put them in his own temple gods. And so now they got to recover and reclaim the honor and glory for Yahweh and for their worship in the temple. They were going back with their property. I imagine that strengthened their spirits. Now the beginning of chapter 2 of Ezra ends up giving us a giant list of people who are returning. Let's jump to verses 64 as we see the summary. A total of 42,360 people returned to Judah. In addition, 7,337 servants, 200 singers, men and women. They took with them horses, mules, camels, lots of donkeys. When they arrived at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the family leaders made voluntary offerings toward the rebuilding of God's temple on its original site. Each leader gave as much as they could. You can see there's gold coins, silver, and even robes for the priests. What I want us to notice in all these numbers and facts and figures and donkeys included is that the people came together. It took everyone, everyone's time, energy, and contribution in order to make this happen. As we see in the scripture, rebuilding takes a community. Sometimes in our lives today, we might experience situations where people give us the cold shoulder. And it's kind of like, well, if you're not leading, then we really don't care if you're here. And you can kind of get that vibe from certain places. But let me assure you, at Echo Church, you are seen and valued, and we absolutely need every single one of you. You're not just hidden. Your contribution counts, and we need it. If we ask you to join in, it's not some hollow request. We need your support. We need your participation. We need your encouragement and your joy. As we begin to gather again in person, and however 2021 ends up looking, we need you. We absolutely do. Please know that your contributions are needed, valued. Your participation means so much to us, and it keeps our church going. It keeps us a church. Let's move forward into chapter 3, and we're going to watch the rebuilding begin. In early autumn, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the peoples assembled in Jerusalem with a unified purpose. Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, joined his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, with his family in rebuilding the altar of the God of Israel. They wanted to sacrifice burnt offering on, on it, as instructed in the law of Moses. Even though the people were afraid of the local residents, they rebuilt the altar at its old site and began to sacrifice burnt offerings to the Lord each morning and evening. 
They celebrated the festival of shelters, sacrificing the number of burnt offerings specified for each day of the festival. Okay, the first part of the temple that was ever rebuilt was the altar itself. They wanted to begin to worship again in the ways they hadn't gotten to for years. They didn't get to have an altar at a temple as they all these years in exile. And all these festivals and feasts that God prescribed, even the joyful occasions and the solemn ones, they, they couldn't do them the same or at all when they were in exile. And here was a chance to worship in the fullness of what God had prescribed for them. They could give their all to Yahweh here again, and that's the first thing that they did. We read that though the people had rebuilt the altar, that's the first thing that was done, and the next thing that needed to be done was the actual foundation for the temple building itself. Let's continue. The construction of the temple of God began in mid-spring, during the second year after they had arrived. The workforce was made up of everyone who had returned from exile to Jerusalem. When the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple... The priests put on their robes, took their places to blow their trumpets, and the Levites clashed their cymbals to praise the Lord, just as King David had prescribed. With praise and thanks, they sang the song to the Lord. He is so good. His faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord, because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. The song they sang is from Psalm 118. And it talks about God's love enduring forever. That doesn't just mean into the future forever. It is recalling all of the past forever. Before time even began for us in humanity, God's love endured. And it will endure evermore. This is the praise that they sang. This is the hope that God's people had. And they, they, they sang of his perpetual love that surrounded them. And they also recalled back to that very first temple. Because in 2 Chronicles 5, we read that at the first temple being built in all its beauty and majesty, the temple that is now destroyed, they did the same worship service there. Trumpeters and singers performed together in unison to praise and give thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices and praised the Lord with these words, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. And at that moment, a thick cloud of the temple filled the Lord, filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. By singing this same song, as was sung that first temple dedication, here the people who return from exile are saying, Please, Yahweh, make your glorious presence fill our presence, our temple, our building, just the same as you have done before. But, Ezra 3.12, but many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders who had seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. Here at this worship service, at this rebuilding, some people were sad. And I can understand their hearts were breaking because they could reimagine all that had come before, all that had been destroyed, and it was heartbreaking. Haggai was a prophet among the people at this time. And he has his own book of the Bible, and we read there that he says, Does anyone remember this house, this temple, and its former splendor? How, in comparison, does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. Well, okay, yeah, thanks, Haggai. Kind of bringing up some bad stuff here. But he brings up the obvious in order to present it and say, Yes, we have mixed emotions. We're feeling sad, but let's also have hope. And God spoke through Haggai to give them this encouragement. But now the Lord says, be strong and get to work, for I am with you, says the Lord Almighty. My spirit remains among you, just as I promised when you came out of Egypt. So do not be afraid. I will fill this place with glory. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, and I will fill the place and bring peace. I, the Lord Almighty, have spoken. And back at that worship service, at the rebuilding moment, it says others were shouting for joy. Ezra 3, verse 12, 13 says, This joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard far in the distance. Here in the worship, there was all these mix of emotions, but they set out to do something new and rebuild again. As I've continued to say, the scripture keeps bringing us, Echo Church, in this present time to mind. 
because our experience as a church, our experience as a community living in this city, the whole world, we're all going through this rebuilding this year. Our return to gathering, it's coming, and we're planning for it on Easter, April 4th. We're hoping to open back up and be very safe in doing so. And listen, we know, just like this exile process, it's going to be a process and a slow one. We're okay with that. We know that some of you, your hearts might be stirred to join us right that very first Sunday. Great. And we're going to also need you in the next five weeks to help us prepare that space. And number two, there's some of you who your hearts are not stirred to go. You're not, you're not on the first wave. That's okay. You're that group waiting at home, still offering support. You're still going to be involved. We need your ideas. We need your prayers. We need your encouragement. We need you to still participate in our church here at your home. But we need both groups, and we need to know that everyone is respected. We want you to choose your safest choice for your household. We love you, and we're part of this church together. We are excited to tell you that 20% of our church has been vaccinated already. Think of how many essential workers are in our midst. That's amazing. Thank you for all of your service and work and for being vaccinated and caring for our community and all you do. I hope this encourages everyone else the same. Now, we might feel a mix of emotions. We might be sad because it's not going to be exactly the same when we meet again. We're going to have to be distanced. We're going to have to wear masks. We're going to have to do some things differently. And we also might be sad if you can't be the ones to come at first. And that breaks our hearts too. But we're going to have this joy that the return is beginning. And then we're going to step by step this process all together. You know, it's been strange and painful to live apart for an entire year. But we've made this sacrifice as a community because we felt our hearts stirred by God. This was the safest, best thing we could do to care for other people. Thank you for being part of that effort. We see in our scriptures, we see the way Jesus lived, that God designed us to live in this communal aspect. That it's not just individuals, that we consider ourselves one piece of the whole. And Jesus died for the whole. And every person who calls upon his name and joins his family and his community, that's who we want to be a part of. That's who we're thinking of and caring about. And our purpose at Echo is to see Jesus' love shared and that community, that family of God continue to grow. And you're a vital part of that. Wherever you are right now, we need you. We need you to be active, encouraging other, one another, reminding each other that God's love endures forever. We need you to live out your faith wherever you are, in your home, at work, in your neighborhood, with the people you see. Keep expanding that love and that community wider and wider. We need you to share your hearts, your time, your resources so that we will continue as a church. That's how it happens. You, me, all of us together, giving a bit, okay? That's what we are. That's what we need from you. That's what we're all going to commit to do together. And we need you to be with us to worship God in all his fullness. To say, yes, Lord, come. Bring glory to your community because we believe that your love was yesterday, it is today, and it will be tomorrow. Will you pray with me? Lord Almighty, we give thanks to you for you are good and your love endures forever. Amen. Wherever you go this week, be the community of God.